cloud server. Okay, here we are. Uh, welcome everyone to another edition of the ISPP virtual seminar series, Asia Pacific region. Uh, today we've got a very interesting uh, presentation from Professor Chuma Owamalam. Oh, oh, Sorry, I, I screwed that up. Um, <laughs> Uh, Chuma is an associate professor of social psychology at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Uh, before that, he was uh, doing a postdoctoral fellowship at Royal Holloway University of London and the University of Manchester. And Chuma's research interest is broadly the psychology of inequality. And the way that he approaches this topic is mainly from the perspective of social identity and system justification theories. Um, and just one thing I'd like to add is he creates brilliant titles. The title of this top uh, of this talk is "If it barks like a dog but slithers like a snake, then it must be a cow." <laughs> Confusion in the system justification literature and the birth of Simsa. Um, I hope you can write all of my uh, journal titles in the future. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Peter. Um, so the the title uh, essentially. Um, uh, depict, if you like, the, the essence of uh, what I'm going to try to talk about in the next four to five minutes or so. So uh, it all it started uh, with me trying to make uh, uh, some sense uh, in uh, a number of the original propositions that the system justification theory makes and a number of the newer auxiliary statements that are attached to that, uh, uh, to those classic statements. When I look, you know, deep, uh, uh, deeper or closer, uh, uh, reading between the lines, um, it occurred to me that there were quite, you know, a, a number of uh, uh, inconsistencies that aren't simply uh, uh, able to be wished away. So today I'm gonna try, you know, to uh, uh, visit a few of those inconsistencies and look at a number of the studies that we've done to try to shed light on the relevant processes. I'm gonna start first of all by you know, presenting a background, you know, to all of this debate. Uh, uh, move on to a number of the past studies that are both supportive of uh, the so-called system justification phenomenon, but also uh, a number of the studies that, that don't um, agree with that perspective. Uh, I'll then try to summarize, you know, uh, the extant uh, um, literature uh, on the topic before, you know, going to this newer uh, a social identity model or systems attitude that we call SIMSA. So I'm just gonna, uh, hopefully that works. So bear with me. Prezi, as I, as I mentioned before, it's not my strong suit. This is entirely my PhD students do it. <laughs> so where is it? <coughs> yeah, right, okay. So, right, so I guess, you know, one of the key things when it comes to the debate between system justification theory and a num um, social identity scholars is why? Why does a number of the puzzling realities that we see that, you know, tend to uh, function in ways that support the, the status quo or the prevailing realities, why do they occur? So for example, why we, would women support a system of male privilege, yeah? So for example, if a man and a woman, you know, is uh, um, uh, contemplating a move, yeah? Uh, why must it always be the case? Well, almost certainly uh, is the case that preference is given for the job of uh, uh, the husband uh, at sometimes at the expense of the wife. Although I should mention that this situation is easy now in some societies, but not so much in other societies. Why would uh, um, an African-American support Trump? Yeah. Why would 
uh, African-American women, black women, uh, use chemicals to try to whiten their skin in order to conform to the Eurocentric beauty standards that are inherent in their society. Why would a gay individual yeah, support gay bashing? Yeah? Why would uh, 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 Blacks uh, um, go hand in glove with law enforcement despite the fatal uh, outcomes that they receive, particularly when, when it comes to the US context. So these are a number of the reasons, you know, very puzzling realities that allow the status quo to be maintained, yeah, and therefore needing some sort of rational explanation as to why they occur. Now, when it comes to the system justification theory, which I've abbreviated here as SGT, yeah, um, their proposition, you know, uh, in trying to get uh, one's head round, you know, the puzzling situation where members of disadvantaged groups embrace, sometimes embrace the very systems that disadvantage them. Um, he says that they say uh, this is uh, uh, a strong evidence to support the hypothesis that we all have as humans a unique system justification motivation that allows us or, or to functions for us to perceive realities as fair, as just, as legitimate. And the sole purpose of this motivation is to maintain societal traditions, yeah? To leave things the way they are, not to benefit oneself or to benefit one's own social identity, but only functioning to leave things the way they are. So in a sense, it does not operate in the service of protecting the interest of the self, or the group. So he made a clear distinction between three motifs. So the one motif is the ego or self, you know, related motivation, which functions to enhance the individual's needs, right? We all know how uh, uh, it is the case that even a toddler may want, like my toddler child, may want, you know, to, to cry in order to satisfy their need for hunger, yes? That's a personal interest, the need to enhance oneself, you know, to get some sort of benefit for oneself. Then the other is the group justification most, uh, motivation, the need to try to maximize the interest of the groups, the social groups that we belong to. Yeah, so this could be our family, this could be our gender group, this could be, you know, all sorts of, you know, social groups that you have, you know, out there. And the third motivation is the system justification motivation, which functions or operates outside of these two traditional motifs that is separate and sometimes independent. It, 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 it works independently from the self and group motifs, particularly when it comes to the case of members of disadvantaged groups. And I'll explain uh, why that is the case later on. Now, according to this perspective, the system justification motivation allows us to get a handle on the seeming irrational behaviors that or, or irrational attitudes that members of disadvantaged communities sometimes present. Yeah. So, for example, an African American who supports law enforcement in the US must be bunkers, must be out of their mind to want to do that. Yeah, so that is seen under the system justification perspective as an irrational behavior. Why would they want to do that? Now, I'm gonna try and uh, 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 get to a different explanation that you know, addresses this sort of question without resorting to the system justification motivation. But before then, I'd like to, you know, uh, uh, um, 
get your attention down to the, the basic, the foundational uh, 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 basis for uh, uh, suggesting that we have a system justification motivation to begin with. So it all started uh, with this very classic study, which I'm sure, uh, well, I suspect the number of you are quite familiar with. But for those who are not, I'm just going to go through that quite briefly to give you a taste of what uh, is at stake uh, uh, in this uh, uh, classic uh, study. So this minimal group paradigm, yeah, it's a method that uh, Henry Tashfell, who is the pioneer of the social identity perspective, used to try to demonstrate the fact that merely categorizing oneself as being a member of one group versus another is in and of itself sufficient to drive group interested behaviors or group, group motivated behaviors, yeah? We want to uh, 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 engage or, or act in manners that satisfies the need or the interest of our social group. So, the ingenious thing that he did, him and his you know, uh, students and colleagues, what they did was to uh, pair up a, a British um, uh, school children yeah, in the Bristol area. So he uh, gave them a number of painting you know, to look at and to you know, uh, uh, um, select which ones they preferred. Okay, so um, unbeknownst to these pupils, you know, this was a ruse uh, that they concocted, you know, to try to make real, you know, what uh, uh, the key aim of the study uh, was essentially. So uh, what they did uh, uh, was to um, assign these pupils to one of these two groups. And I'm, completely arbitrary basis, yeah? They told them that they liked, you know, your, your preferences indicate that you like uh, uh, the paintings of Vasily Kandinsky uh, more than, you know, the other. And for another group of uh, 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 students, it told them that, you know, the preferences showed, you know, that they liked the paintings of Paul, you know, Klee more so than, so he, assign them into these two arbitrary groups based on their um, uh, liking, you know, for, well, assumed liking of the painting that comes from either uh, the artist called Klee or the artist called Kandinsky. Now he, pre he presented them with uh, a number of choices in a point uh, matrix, yeah, on which the students were to allocate points uh, to individuals who share a similar painting and therefore a member of their own group, or individuals who do not share a painting that is the other painter, and therefore the out group. And what they found essentially was that uh, these children consist, well, were uh, more often or, or significantly more likely to award greater points to those uh, uh, other students who share a similar preference in terms of, you know, their liking for paintings versus the our group, yeah? So essentially the message there was that, hey, I've got your back, yeah, so long as you like what I like. Okay. Right. So uh, uh, that phenomenon is referred to as in-group favoritism. Yeah. So if you see in-group favoritism much later on when I talk, uh, uh, that's what it refers to the tendency to want to maximize interest for one's group at the, at the expense of uh, the uh, other group or the our group. So I'm just gonna move this out of view for a minute. Now, the interesting thing then is that if much of social identity theory relies 
on the idea that we all act in group interested ways, yeah? Our social identities define our group motifs. So we want to have each other's back. Why is it then that sometimes we see instances of our group favoritism, that is the reverse of in-group favoritism? So in a number of studies that were conducted by, I think, Boris and Sashtev uh, 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 in the 80s, what they found was that when you account for social status, yeah, uh, and you ask uh, members of high and low status to award points to one another, members of low status groups tend to evaluate the higher status group in a more positive light compared to their group, while the reverse you know, uh, in-group favoritism was shown amongst members of the highest. Picture. So the question then is, that, and this is the thing that uh, um, was at the back of the mind of system justification scholars, you know, they couldn't get, shake that, you know, away, is why is, why is it then that our group favoritism occurs? if we are all motivated either by personal interest or by group interest, what about these instances where people are, you know, obviously acting against their group interest? So um, according to their view, there probably might be a simpler explanation uh, to this our group favoritism effect, yeah? Never mind, you know, that the social identity scholars have tried, you know, to uh, explain when uh, agrofavoritism might occur. Yeah, never mind that. What they you know, uh, uh, capitalized on is this phenomenon. They couldn't, they couldn't buy any explanation from the uh, uh, social identity scholars. They say, according to them, that there must be a third motivation outside of these two traditional ones, ego and group justification needs, that individuals also possess a system justification that only functions to maintain the status quo. So for example, if you have a hierarchy between the rich and the poor, yeah, a system justification motivation functions to maintain that hierarchy. It doesn't serve the interests of the person or the group, okay? So, and this is why I try always, you know, to use direct statement from the original, the classic uh, uh, theory itself. And here it says that system justification does not offer an equivalent function that operates in the service of protecting the self, personal, or the group, okay? So we're going to try to have this statement at the back of our minds. When we revisit the number of the evidence that they have uh, uh, produced, you know, to try to support these primary statement. Right, so um, be, be, uh, uh, going forward, yeah, uh, when we, we say, or when uh, the scholars of system justification uh, perspective say that there is a third motivation that functions outside of the problem with this statement is that um, there isn't any way to show that these system justification motivation exists to begin with, yeah, or whether in fact it is needed. Yeah, and these are the two primary issues at stake in the in the recent debate that we had with uh, the system justification scholars. Yeah, that is the question of first existence of this system justification motivation, and two necessity of the system justification. Is it really necessary to have a third motivation beyond? The, the traditional ones of self and group, okay? I'm gonna try to look at a number of these uh, uh, conundrum 
that we now find ourselves in, you know, based on these uh, origin. The one that I tried to highlight, number three from our, that debate is that, again, you know, going back to that original statement that I emphasized earlier, is that they tell us that system justification, you know, motivation does not offer an equivalent function that operates in the service of protecting the self and the group, blah, blah, blah. But it, it is also beneficial to people's personal well being. We can all agree that personal well-being is a self-interest, right? So if system justification does not function in the service of self and group, why does it make us feel good sometimes, yeah? Now, the second one is that they say system justification is most likely to occur when personal and group interests are weak. And this is, again, you know, uh, a caveat uh, or an assumption that they created uh, to be able to show that, you know, if we can get personal and group interests sufficiently weak, yeah, then any manifestation of uh, uh, attitudes or behavior that tend to support can only be attributed to the system justification motivation, yeah? But, you know, soon after they say uh, it shouldn't, the system, we shouldn't find the system justification motivation, you know, operational if personal and group interests, you know, are, you know, strong. Then they also go on to say that, you know, system justification is likely to occur when people are invested in their social systems, yeah? And the social systems, sometimes are part and parcel of people's identity. So for example, you know, the Canadian social system, Canada is a group identity. If you identify strongly with Canada or you're invested in that, it is all going to reflect your social identity needs rather than a system justification. So I could go on and on, you know, each individual uh, uh, point that we raised, but I'm also mindful that we haven't got, you know, too much time, and I'm just going to leave it at this too, yeah? So system justification is oppressionalized as being inversely related to personal and group needs, especially for members of disadvantaged groups. But at the same time, uh, we are told that system justification in some cases actually enhance the personal well being of members of disadvantaged groups. And the question we ask is simply which is it? Right, so um, we've gone you know, away from, you know, the uh, sort of uh, the historical uh, roots of this debate, yeah? Now, the question that you may then have for me is, is there a simpler explanation then, yeah, that relies on these traditional motifs, yeah? Uh, if system justification scholars have come forward and say, oh, come on, we have a simpler explanation and they've brought along with them all these inconsistencies. I'm sure, you know, I, I would be, it, it is perfectly reasonable that you also ask me whether uh, uh, there is a simpler explanation to what we are trying to explain. So today, what I will try to do or to accomplish are two things. Yeah, I try to present evidence disputing a number of the foundational assumptions of the system justification perspective, you know, that created the, num the confusion that we are now uh, in. Then, you know, uh, uh, finally then, I would look at the development of the alternative, and I would say a simpler explanation one that relies on the traditional motifs of group interest. Right, so um, we'll begin by uh, looking at 
the key propositions and assumptions of the system justification perspective. Remember what um, I uh, had said earlier in terms of the diagnosticity of the system justification motivation is that it be inversely related to group motive, especially for members of low status groups. And there is a rationale for that. The rationale that the system justification you know, scholars have advanced yeah, for uh, this inverse relationship um, between group motives and system motives from, uh, amongst members of low status group is that there should be a tension between the system justification motivation and group interested motives. And this should produce cognitive dissonance, yeah? So in the previous example that we had used, so the African-American supporting law enforcement in America in order to uh, um, enforce the rule of law, yeah? To maintain the system of rule of law, yeah? Something has got to give, yeah? So on the one hand, they want to enhance the outcomes of their uh, 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 ethnic group yeah, so that they're receiving fairer outcomes, at least comparable to other groups in American society. So the need you know, to make that known, yeah, and one way to do so is to try to rock the system somewhat, you know, via, for example, protest, yeah, like you see with the Black Lives Matter movement and so forth, yeah, so that is an agitation to try to present you know, the, the view that they are not okay with the way the system works as it currently is, yeah? So there lies the, the, uh, the tension between the system motive, the need to maintain law and order, and the group motive, the need you know, to have one's group obtain fairer you know, law enforcement outcomes within American society, yeah? So that produces, you know, these dissonance and dissonance is an uncomfortable psychological reality that individuals are often motivated to try to resolve. Yeah. Now, it gets, you know, uh, uh, more in, interesting when we drill down. Now, ac according to the reasoning behind the system justification theory, yeah, it is easier for individuals to try to change themselves, to try to change their own attitudes and preferences, including their group motives. It, it's uh, uh, easier to put a check on it, yeah, um, than to try to thwart existing realities, yeah, the society at large, yeah, that it would be an uphill, uphill task to try to do that. Yeah, so one way to at least immediately resolve the cognitive dissonance, yeah, and be able to go about, you know, one's life, you know, okay, is to tame one's group motives, yeah. But this would happen, yeah, if the group interests and identities are sufficiently low in salience to begin with, yeah. And this is where everything began to crumble down when it comes to logic, as I would explain later on. So according to the system justification scholars, members of disadvantaged groups should be more likely to engage in system justification. That is the system justification motivation should, be, should prevail when group identities and interests are sufficiently deemed, yeah? Right, so there is evidence uh, out there, um, uh, as re researchers, we know, you know, if you want to find numbers for any reality at all, uh, uh, you, you know, there's always numbers that you could interpret, you know, to suit your needs. So uh, uh, it so happens that we find a negative association between uh, social status and system justification. Hooray! 
that is evidence uh, they say is supportive of the uh, uh, thesis that there is a system. Why else would members of low status groups support a system that disadvantages them to support it more so, be more enthusiastic supporters of these disadvantages reality compared to individuals who benefit from it, yeah? So there is only gonna be one explanation for it. And that is the system justification motivation, yeah? And the idea that the cognitive dissonance that individuals experience, the need to resolve that pushes individuals to maximize you know, their endorsement of those realities, to convince people that what they are saying is really uh, what is. So we find that in these two classic studies, Henry and Saul, they show that uh, amongst uh, Latin American children who come from low status groups, that they were more supportive of the system compared to their high status counterparts. Now, uh, uh, John uh, uh, Just and his colleagues also found uh, that amongst members of low status, including African Americans, they tended to oppose uh, the redistribution of, of wealth, yeah, which is uh, inconsistent with, you know, the, the economic disadvantage that African-Americans face uh, in the US. So why else would that happen if not for the existence of a system justification motivation? Now, there is one problem though, with these uh, uh, classic uh, uh, big data you know, studies that rely on public opinions. They make one key assumption that has never been tested empirically. Yeah? Um, they say that self-interest, well, their assumption is that self and group interests are relatively low in salience when people are responding to general public surveys. So if you have a bunch, you know, a dozen questions, you know, some related to your identity, some unrelated to your identity, you know, that situation is unlikely to enhance the salience of your uh, social identity. And in that context, therefore, we can assume that uh, group interests are sufficiently low in salience and you know, personal interests are also sufficiently low. And you know, the fact that individuals in that context are engaged in a system justifying behaviors or attitudes can only be attributed to the existence of a system justification motivation. There are two bots, yeah, no pun intended when it comes to uh, these assumption. Now, we tried you know, to uh, examine these foundational uh, uh, assumptions that they make that in public surveys, that you know, when you're completing system justification measures, that your uh, social identities are unlikely to be sailing, yeah? So we did a very simple, uh, a word fragment experiment, which uh, a BSE student of mine designed, yeah, uh, to try, you know, to identify whether, you know, that was the case essentially. So what we did was to ask, uh, assign participants into three groups. In one group, they completed a national system justification scale, yeah. Um, in a second group, they completed the gender system justification scale, which is of our primary interest, and that's the experimental condition. And we also have another control condition in which they didn't complete any scale at all. Remember, the assumption that these folks are making is that when you complete these scales in large surveys, you know, especially when you, you your uh, identities are unlikely to be salient. Now, the argument that we've made elsewhere, yeah, is that even when individuals are completing system justification measures, yeah, they sometimes include, you know, uh, uh, labels of those respective identities, yeah. So, for example, uh, the Canadian system, the American system, 
you know, the fact that you're uh, the re relations between men and women and so forth. OK, so that in itself already is tied, you know, to social identities. But we wanted to do uh, an experiment, yeah, which we paid daily for 605 participants from Prolific. It wasn't a cheap experiment, yeah, just to show this very simple, to illustrate this fact that when individuals complete the skills, their identities are also sufficiently salient. So uh, we had them complete word fragments that could be completed with a gender related uh, uh, word, yeah? And there were other words that could complete those word fragments apart from those gender related realities. Then in another uh, uh, thing that we gave them, we, uh, expose them to words, yeah, gender neutral words, you know, words that you cannot complete with a gender related uh, uh, um, expression, yeah. And our interest was to then see uh, the extent to which individuals who have been assigned to complete a gender system justification uh, scale, whether they uh, complete you know, the scales with, you know, uh, gender related concepts, yeah, that are tied to gender identity, like masculinity, uh, uh, femininity, you know, and so forth, or, or sexism, which is a clear interest when it comes to men, but also women uh, in particular. Now on the graph that you see here in A, is the key results that we are interested in. But we also included participants on gender as a factoring variable to see how men and women performed on those tasks overall, yeah? And what we found, uh, um, of course, is that for men, the advantage group, yeah, there was no discernible differences. They didn't, you know, uh, um, uh, complete the word fragments uh, in any meaningful way, yeah. They uh, equally selected gender related and not only, but for women, we find clear evidence that for these uh, disadvantaged group, the gender related concept were much more salient in their mind, which goes back to the idea that especially for members of disadvantaged groups, their identities are quite important when making decisions about their relation to the system. But let's go back again to A. Uh, uh, mind you, we had six neutral words uh, and then six gender related words, yeah? So on the Y axis that you see here, yeah, uh, uh, a score of six would mean that uh, a score of 0.6 would mean that all uh, participants completed all the word fragments with gender related concepts, yeah? So uh, what we find here is that it was only in the gender system justification completions uh, 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 condition, yeah? When they completed a gender system justification scale, that in, you know, that has links, you know, to concept tied to gender. It was only in that condition that we find, you know, that for both men and women, that you have uh, more um, uh, word fragments being completed with gender-related uh, words compared to gender-unrelated words. Interestingly, in the control condition, when they didn't complete any scale at all, you find you know, that uh, completing the uh, word fragments yeah, were dimmer for gender related words. So it isn't the case that we find these effects here simply because it was easy for participants to complete you know, these gender related uh, expressions. In fact, this control condition here shows us the opposite. In fact, it was even much more difficult you know, for them to voice those uh, uh, concepts to begin with. So 
this shows that this is empirical evidence to show that the key assumptions that they make when it comes to these public surveys in terms of the non-salience of you know, the respective identities uh, uh, tied to the system justification measures that they are completing, it's simply fiction. Now, the second part, that you would uh, that one may raise is that okay you've showed us that this assumption does not have basis in reality. What about the the uh, the formality of those assumptions to begin with? Do the salience or the strength of these social identities matter when people are completing system justification uh, uh, skills? Okay, now. When you look at a recent multi-lab experiment that was led by Mark Brandt, yeah, I was also fortunate to be part of that collaboration uh, um, across 30 nations, and I think it was 66, you know, labs in total. We find an interaction between uh, identity uh, uh, salience and uh, uh, status, yeah but we show that it was for members of low status groups, they supported the system more strongly, that, that is the system justified more strongly when their identity was salient, yeah? Not when their identity were non-salient. Now, when it comes to strength of group interests or group identities, we also have evidence in that regard in the sense that when we, um, administered uh, system justification measures to ethnic minority individuals here in Malaysia, yeah? And when we um, had those uh, minority ethnic group to either think about the advantages that they get in Malaysian society versus the disadvantages that their group gets in Malaysian society. We find that when group disadvantage was salient in their mind, yeah, it was in that condition where the, uh, a strong investment in their group, yeah, raised system justification. So to the extent that they felt they had a stake in the Malaysian society, this is the time that they embraced the Malaysian society much more strongly. It, it, you probably go like, ah, this is so intuit intuitive, it makes sense now. Why didn't anyone think about these things before the 25 years of system justification perspective? And our answer is always is, you know, it goes back to the system justification scholars, you know, essentially uh, to do uh, uh, their homework. So yeah, you know, it, it, it comes with the gotcha moment, yeah, a system justification a scholar would say, based on this evidence, oh, okay, you've got me now. Uh, but there's this other thing that you still haven't addressed, and that is the cognitive dissonance assumption. So, uh, whether it be the Brandt et al. collaboration, whether it be the paper that, I, um, that we published in the Journal of Social Issues. None of these previous studies, including the classic study by Mark Brandt, looking at the status legitimation hypothesis, although he uh, addressed the, the issue of cognitive dissonance, but that was indirectly. He didn't, he assumed certain realities produce cognitive dissonance. He didn't measure cognitive dissonance directly. And it makes sense that a system justification scholar would uh, 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 ask, what about this cognitive dissonance assumption? You haven't tested it. So you can't really say that our opinions don't you know, count when you haven't you know, ruled what we are saying out. So we uh, heed to that challenge you know, to uh, look at the cognitive dissonance basis uh, uh, for system justification. Remember, uh, for members of disadvantaged groups, the proposition has always been that cognitive dissonance should be apparent and cause system justification when group identities are weakly 
sailing. So I'm gonna look at one test that we carried out, uh, one study out of uh, a, a number that we've just got published, uh, looking at that particular idea directly. Now, we uh, use the pupil dilation paradigm here for many of you uh, uh, who are familiar with the uh, uh, pupil dilation uh, paradigm. Um, the, the pupil fluctuates or you know, dilates uh, uh, sometimes when you know, we are processing information. Yeah, and cognitive dissonance implies that you know we are thinking much more than we we ordinarily would have. Yeah, we are contemplating opposing realities. If the realities are straightforward, bam, it's a, a straightforward decision to make, and therefore no no cognitive effort, and therefore no pupil dilation in that regard. But if we are making you know, contemplation you know, between two alternative motifs that has the potential to steer us in one direction or the other, we need to expand some sort of cognitive effort and that should reflect in our pupil sizes as well. So we adopted that approach, uh, which was made popular in the 1960s by uh, Hayes and Holt, yeah. Uh, uh, I think it was published in the Science Magazine, uh, uh, who showed you know, that when we are working on a difficult task, uh, say mathematics, um, our pupils dilate you know, much more in size you know, compared to when we are doing an easy task. So to try to capture the realities you know, at, um, in question when it comes to the debate between system justification and Simsim, we manipulated two realities. In the first reality, we manipulated the group, uh, the salience of group identities, yeah? So uh, for our Chinese, ethnic Chinese participants who are, by the way, minorities in Malaysian society, uh, they have uh, a certain uh, uh, a situation in the Malaysian uh, um, society. So on the one hand, they are privileged economically, but on the other hand, they are disadvantaged politically. Okay, so we use these two realities to manipulate group ad advantage and group disadvantage. Yeah, after we had increased the salience of their Chinese ethnic identity by asking them to think and write about three things that they could remember about their Chinese ethnic group. Uh, and in a weak identity salience condition, we simply ask them to write three things about their grandma, okay? Right, so um, uh, following the, these two manipulations, we exposed them to the eye tracker, yeah? Where they were to then uh, uh, contemplate supporting a number of the systems that we presented to them. Yeah, including the transportation system in uh, Malaysia, the UMNO political party, uh, which is the predominantly Malay uh, enterprise, uh, and you know that essentially you know uh, um, you know caters more to uh, the uh, needs of uh, the Malay ethnic group uh, in Malaysia. And you have the healthcare system, you have the Mara scholarship. Also the Mara scholarship is a system uh, that privileges uh, uh, individuals who come from the Malay ethnic background, yeah, uh, given their presumed uh, um, uh, uh, disadvantage when it comes to education relative to their ethnic Chinese or Indian counterparts, okay? So, um, the, the, the tricky bit about this um, pupil dilation paradigm is that we wanted to be sure that the dilation we get is as a result of the cognitive dissonance that we're ongoing. So we didn't immediately ask them to rate the system justification scale. We gave them instruction. Uh, um, in the next slide, you will see uh, um, a system 
uh, that operates in Malaysian society. Uh, we want you to contemplate on it and you know, try to work out what your attitudes uh, uh, would be you know, for those systems that in a subsequent slide will then give them uh, the opportunity to indicate their responses uh, coming up from the decisions they had already made, yeah? So that we are able to capture, yeah, those decision, the processing of the decision, yeah, rather than, you know, simply regurgitating the answer, you know, in the answer slide. So it was quite Im Im important that our experimental protocol um, adjusted to those, you know, finer details. Right, so what we, <coughs> what we find here is that uh, uh, these bars represent the size of the pupil diameter. So we average the uh, pupil fluctuations for the left eye and the right eye, yeah? So what you see here is the average for both the right and the left eye. So what we see here is that when they are in uh, the uh, identity salient condition, when they uh, thought and wrote, you know, three things about the ethnic group, the pupil, you know, dilated more strongly compared to when they, they thought about, you know, their grandmother. Yeah. Now this is the interesting bit, you know, uh, in. Uh, the results, yeah, because it shows in support of system justification theory that the pupil dilation was stronger, that is, uh, members when the Chinese ethnic group members were thinking about their group's disadvantage, it was at this point that the uh, cognitive processing was stronger. The cognitive effort that they expended in trying to work out their support for the systems was stronger compared to the advantage group, yeah? And here, we also vary the importance of those systems that they contemplated so that the systems were either very important, not so very important, and so forth, okay? Or neutral, yeah? When it comes to, you know, which we use to capture the idea of system dependency, the extent to which they depended because it is an important caveat for the system just. So the, the interesting result is this one labeled overall here on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And what it shows is that it is, uh, um, the participants expended greater cognitive effort implying dissonance, yeah, only when their identity were strongly salient yeah, and they were thinking about their group's disadvantage, yeah. These effect did not occur in any of the other three conditions, okay. When we accounted for the importance of the system, yes, uh, uh, we were able to show that when the system is highly important or individuals felt they were dependent on those systems, that's when you find that effect. But it, it, it is supportive of SJT, but also more strongly for, as, um, for the SIMSA perspective, because it shows that it is when your group is important to you, when you have a vested interest in your group that you tend to support its systems. Right, so, this is, you know, one of the critical tests that we have used to try, you know, to put to rest the idea of the cognitive dissonance basis for system justification. Now, these days, uh, you also see uh, a number of research coming forth, uh, claiming to find supportive evidence for the system justification perspective. Um, for example, a group of researchers for, from Beijing University uh, have found supportive evidence that in China, the, the uh, status legitimacy uh, uh, thesis is visible and is visible for a particular kind of measuring status, 
yeah, not all ways of oppression are uh, oppressionalizing status. <clears throat> that it only manifests when status is measured objectively in terms of income, education, but it does not manifest when uh, um, status is measured subjectively. Again, it raises questions. Should different operationalizations of status yield similar or different outcomes? Yeah. So in the scientific way, um, one way to, to test the re robustness of a particular phenomenon is to look at different ways in which you know, a reality can manifest. In this case, status, it can manifest objectively or subjectively. If you're making a theory that, uh, or if, if you're making a, a prediction that relies on these realities, then it shouldn't really matter which operationalization you use, you should be able to come up with the same solution, yeah? So in our view, this negative association that can you know, sometimes be found between objective status and uh, system justification, which has been used you know, to claim support for the system justification perspective that we can, it is possible to try to explain that using social identity principles. And we put that to test. I think um, if I was listening carefully at the outset of, uh, before I started talking, I think it was Michael that was talking, uh, uh, um, uh, I didn't hear it properly, was just uh, about cultures, yeah? So, Culture is part and parcel of you know, the social groups that we come from, yeah? And in Asia, for example, where you often find these negative association between objective status and system justification, um, there is an element, there is a culture that actually prescribes harmony uh, between you know, people or you know, in, the, uh, in the way things function. Confusion doctrine, for example, uh, which was the thing that I was trying to fish out uh, the other time. Um, uh, and this is an extract from a paper that we, we, we had just uh, revised and resubmitting, um, makes a very strong emphasis on, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're seeing my screen. Are you seeing the... Uh, the the test yes, from yes. a review paper right okay so um so the, the the idea of doing extreme things yeah is frowned upon if you like yeah the idea of creating en uh, enemies or being in conflict yeah it's something that is frowned upon uh, based on the confusion you know doctrine and this is a, 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 um a, a, an idea that is also are uh, embraced by a number of um, philosophical you know, perspective here in Asia, yeah? Uh, uh, um, whether it be the, uh, the uh, one from uh, Jainism, uh, whether it be uh, philosophical, uh, moral philosophies, you know, that we could find from, uh, where, uh, what, what, what was it called again, from, uh, the Islamic doctrine, the inshallah, yeah, there is some sort of, you know, advice to the populace, yeah, to try to maintain harmony, yeah, to let, you know, those who are at the top be at the top, let the fathers be a father, let the son, those who are at, at the bottom, be sons, yeah, this is one of uh, a strong moral philosophy in uh, Asian society. So we we thought that a number of the negative association that you often find within Asian societies between objective status and system just can be more parsimoniously be explained, you know, by you know cultural prescriptions within those societies. So the need for harmony uh, should be stronger in Asian societies or collectivistic societies. And the need for social harmony should also be stronger in those 
societies that you know don't want to rock the boat. Yeah. So Asian societies are known if you're a whistleblower, you're looked at in some way, you get you know scorned and everything. Yeah. So it goes back to the idea that folks here, uh, especially in collectivistic societies that are oriented around the social group, harmony within the social group, yeah, uh, there is very little tolerance for those individuals who rock the boat. So uh, in that sense, individuals who subscribe to the harmony norm, as, especially if they come from an objectively low status, we would expect them you know, to uh, embrace the system, to support the system, yeah? Uh, in those to not complain, essentially, yeah. Then for their high status counterparts, uh, those who enjoy privileges, the 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 system as it is already affords them, you know, privileges in society, yeah. And given the harmony norm, yeah, you know, being enthusiastic supporters of systems that provide privilege to you may seem like you're flaunting your wealth, your flaunting, the privileges that you have. And that could also rock the boat. And members of high status groups in uh, these kinds of cultures may be wary of doing that, which may uh, uh, cause them to dim uh, um, or to mask you know, their uh, um, uh, system support uh, uh, in order uh, to uh, not egg you know, the uh, um, uh, unprivileged uh, uh, ma majority, yeah, or the disadvantaged majority. Now, we, we tested this idea uh, using uh, data from the Watts Values Survey, yeah, so we made sure that we had, you know, uh, um, as many of the waves as possible so that we wouldn't be accused of cherry picking the data, yeah, as often is the case when there is, you know, high stakes in a debate like this. So uh, in total, our participants was over, you know, 100,000. And what we find essentially, uh, if you look at the figures here, is that when individuals are placed in uh, individualistic cultures, yeah, uh, objective social status tended to be positively related to system justification, yeah? But for those in the collectivistic culture where harmony, group harmony is key, you find this negative association between objective uh, uh, status and system justification. So the issue is not the distinction between whether uh, uh, we measure status in terms of objective or whether we measure it in terms of subjective. If you dig deeper into you know, these realities, we find that a number of other realities, we argue social identity really related, can structure this relationship in ways in which we can find both the negative relationship, but also the positive relationship that we find, you know, elsewhere as well. And that is, you know, true also when we look at another proxy of harmony uh, norm in terms of uncertainty avoidance. In this case, we find a negative association between objective status and system justification in those societies that are highly uh, avoidant of uncertainty. Yeah, in those societies that are more tolerant of uncertainty, in, uh, in which case they could go out and protest, the system can absorb the shock that comes with such chaos. Yeah, um, then you see a positive association between uh, objective status and system justification. So it isn't about the way in which we measure, you know, status. If we measure it objectively or subjectively, we find these pattern of results emerging. Right, so <clears throat> in summary, what we find is, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna enlarge that a little bit. So. 
uh, what we find is uh, inconsistencies in the theoretical postulations of the system justification perspective. We also find that in a number of the key assumptions that they make with regards to the evidence that they have produced to support the system justification thesis, yeah, uh, we find that uh, when we test them rigorously, they do not pan out. Now, the questions over the foundational you know, dissonance ad assumption now provided the impetus uh, for rethinking the way in which we uh, frame system justifying attitudes, yeah, which led to the birth of Simza. Yeah? So uh, Simza, um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, offers, yeah, its contribution is that it uh, uh, questions the need for the system justification motivation, yeah, as a necessary, you know, variable when you're considering system justifying attitude, both from the perspective of the advantage, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the uh, system justifying attitudes of members of disadvantaged groups, yeah that you can, it is possible to explain system justifying tendencies amongst members of disadvantaged groups uh, using the traditional group motifs. Now under the SIMSA umbrella uh, are three key things at the moment, yeah? Uh, three key postulations. So when we conceive of our social system, yeah, um, uh, as being stable in the short term and also in the long term, yeah, then we are likely to acquiesce, you know, with the system. We passively accept, you know, it is what it is, yeah, essentially, uh, 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 um, so goes the uh, social reality explanation. Now, the second explanation is that when the social system is perceived as one, uh, as an in-group, so in this case, I'll use again the example of African-Americans and American society, yeah? So America and its institutions, including the police, the, the courts, the government and everything, they're all systems under these American umbrella. So when we conceive this system, the American system, as a group, then we are likely to act in ways, in the normal ways of favoring the groups that we belong to. Yeah. So system justification uh, in this instance is merely a reflection of uh, group interest at the superordinate level of identification. So when we identify with an inclusive social identity like America, like Hong Kong or, or China, like Malaysia uh, or wherever else, yeah, then we're likely to embrace the systems within that identity, regardless of whether it, um, uh, hams, you know, on the cuffs, you know, our interests, the interests of our group every now and then, yeah? Because there, it, this system is huge. There are other benefits that we can accrue from our membership in that system. So that's the second one. The third explanation that we have under the Simser umbrella at present is that when the social system is seen as being stable in the short term, but has the potential to change in the long term, in the near future, yeah, then we can accept the reality, the status quo, the existing reality as it is right now, in the hope that sometime in the future, things would be better and our group can advance to become either equal to competing groups or be able to surpass them. Yeah, so in a sense, the system is seen as a vehicle to address group needs. If we do away with the system, what hope do we have to advance our interests? So that's the idea that this uh, hope explanation is trying to convey. 
Now, of course, the question is, where is the evidence? Um, we have uh, already done you know, plenty evidence for the superordinate uh, in-group bias explanation. You, you, you find that uh, um, th this is not in dispute. The system justification scholars also accept you know, that this could be uh, a driver of system justification. So I'm not gonna dwell too much you know, on that already accepted reality, only to say that in a recent study that we just got published, we find also evidence of that uh, um, uh, relationship. So that when individuals strongly identify with their country, then they are more likely to embrace, you know, to trust, you know, the governments that run uh, their nation. Now, the second explanation, which is a little bit more contestable, uh, 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 based on the debate that we had, is the hope explanation to the system justification scholars. Uh, there isn't any type of realistic or unrealistic hope that could make members of you know, chronically disadvantaged groups, you know, to support uh, a very system that disadvantaged them, yeah? In fact, you know, just was very specific in identifying, you know, that uh, it is unlikely that a chronically disadvantaged group like women or uh, African-Americans would support economic systems that disadvantage them. Yeah, so we chose those realities that he had so much confidence that members of chronically disadvantaged groups are unlikely to support so that it gives a rigorous rather than a slap on the face, you know, sort of test, you know, for the propositions that we are making. So we piloted, you know, this idea uh, in, two studies prior to a registered uh, uh, a main study. So in that study, what we essentially you know, did was to induce optimism or lack of it yeah, by using, by uh, leading our participants to, well, we misled our participants uh, to think you know, that gender uh, pay gap was either stable yeah, as in the no hope condition that you find in the figure labeled B, or that it is gradually reducing. Yeah, it is, it is it, there is movement, yeah, which should give someone the hope that at some point in the future uh, that uh, it would even out, yeah, or women might even overtake uh, men when it comes to gender pay gap. Yeah, so we use that to create optimism. So if the system is stable, as in, in the no hope condition, it provides very little hope that things are going to change, right? But if the system is fluctuating downwards to parity, then we can assume we could have some hope that at some point in the future, that things are gonna get better. Right, so uh, uh, these are the propositions or, or the patterns that you would expect from these two perspectives, yeah? So you remember for, 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 for John or for Just, yeah, um, hope has nothing to do with system just, whether, whether it be realistic or unrealistic hope, it's got nothing to do with system justification, yeah? And we expected, you know, the uh, uh, pessimism uh, that uh, uh, just prescribes uh, uh, under the system justification umbrella to manifest most strongly uh, when uh, gender identity, because we targeted, you know, gender group, yeah, women in this instance, yeah. So when their gender identity, when they're least invested in their gender identity, because it is at that point, you know, that we would expect the system motif to prevail and the group motif to take a back seat, okay? While for uh, Simza, we expected the pattern of result, the hope induced system justification to manifest most strongly when individuals are hopeful that at some point in the future, things are gonna get better. And we expected this to occur 
for individuals who are women who are strongly invested in their gender identity. Yeah, because you know, uh, in that sense, it would mean that group motives are operational rather than system motives that are independent and separate from uh, group motives. Right, so this is a uh, uh, sort of an um, aggregation of all the results that we found across the studies, looking at the effect of hope uh, on system justification, economic system justification for women who are strongly identified with their group versus weakly identified with their group. So you could see on uh, the bottom line here, you know, indicates the effect sizes, yeah? So numbers that are above the zero mark, that is the middle line here, the dotted lines, yeah? That are above, yeah, going in the right direction of the screen, denotes a positive effect. And that positive effect implies that people are justifying the system more strongly when hope, uh, when they are assigned to the hope condition relative to the no hope condition. Now, a negative relationship would be on the left-hand side of the dotted line in the middle here, yeah, away from zero, yeah, and that would mean that individuals are justifying the system more strongly in a condition where there is no hope, which is the prescription of the system justification perspective. And uh, we want to see whether these you know, fluctuations occur yeah, in the manner that is expected from the SIMSA perspective versus the SJT perspective. Now, if you look at the, uh, the, the first, uh, uh, the top panel, yeah, the dark uh, effect size uh, estimate that you see on the forest uh, plot yeah, indicates the overall, the aggregated, the meta-analyzed effect across all the studies and across all the mani um, manifestations of hope. Yeah? And what we find is a significant positive effect of hope for strong identifiers. Yeah? However, on the bottom panel here, where we have the weak identifiers, yeah, we find that there isn't any, um, uh, the effect size, the aggregate yeah, of effect sizes across all studies and across all measurements of hope did not differ, uh, differentiate from zero in a meaningful way, okay? So the evidence here appeared to support more strongly the SIMSA perspective, but goes against uh, the uh, system justification perspective. Now, the third explanation that we gave is the social reality explanation. And this is one of the most contested uh, uh, explanation that we have given under the SIMSA umbrella. Yeah, so during that debate, that was, uh, um, you know, some uh, deviation from, you know, dealing with, you know, the key issue and it, it, it became a debate about the use of uh, a football uh, a league analogy, okay? So, but never mind that, yeah. Uh, let's, you know, zoom in to the football analogy that was so very, you know, voraciously attacked during that debate. What we simply said, yeah, the, 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 um, uh, the point that we were making was that in a social hierarchy, yeah, as you could sometimes see on a league table, there are in, uh, 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 teams or clubs that are consistently at the top and therefore high status. There are also clubs that are consistently at the bottom and therefore low status. Now, if you call members of you know, the high performing club and the low performing club, yeah, and ask them which team, which clubs are the champions, those from the lower performing club, I'm going to say 
that their club are the champions because the reality forbids that. The reality is that they are at the bottom. But those at the top, you know, can quite, it's easier for them to say, yes, we are the champions. Yeah. So in that instance, the outgroup favoring attitude that they are expressing is a, a, a simple reflection of the reality. They are just calling things the way that it is. It is what it is, essentially. Yeah. So they cannot twist that reality to favor their group. Yeah. And this is, you know, one thing that the system justification uh, 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 scholars, you know, find very difficult, you know, to to get a handle on. But you know, let's drag this football analogy closer home to an instance of a chronic disadvantage. Let's, for example, imagine that the gender uh, uh, inequality index is like a league table for men and women that shows who performs better in terms of you know, uh, uh, outcomes in income, in healthcare, in, in whatever else, yeah? That shows in year on year, which group is at the top and which group is at the bottom, yeah? And on these metrics, the gender development index and the gender inequality index, you could conceive of them as a league table. And in this league table, men perform better than women. Women are consistently at the bottom in relation to men. Yeah, whether rightly or wrongly, yeah, we are not contesting, you know, the legitimacy of that classification here. We're just trying to map that uh, reality onto the football analogy. So we, <coughs> we capitalized on this real world example. Yeah, just to show whether reality constrains individuals to justify systems of inequality. In this case, male privilege. Yeah, we asked them uh, if there was uh, some uh, scarcity in jobs or uh, uh, blah blah blah. Would you prefer, you know, that the job went to the man of the house or the, or the woman? Yeah, so that would be a clear show of a male privilege. Yeah, if women say give it to men, yeah, uh, 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 as opposed to women, that is a clear instance of supporting a system of male privilege. Yeah, so our goal was to see the extent to which, when they when we compare their responses ac across the league table, yeah? So societies where this inequality is very severe, yeah? Where reality, the forces of social reality constraint should also be stronger because there is a glaring picture of male privilege in those societies, yeah? Uh, we, want, we wanted to see whether in those instances, we, uh, whether women would, contest their uh, male privilege or to embrace it because it is what it is, yeah? <coughs> now on this, <coughs> on the GDI, the way that it is calculated, uh, lower scores mean greater gender inequality. It means there's a stark uh, 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 divide between the outcomes of men and women, incontrovertible, you know, different. For the GII, uh, the higher the score, the more gender unequal, yeah? So you would expect uh, a negative association uh, with, uh, between the GDI and support for male privilege amongst women, yeah? Based on Sims's social reality constraint explanation, uh, when you use, you know, the GDI, but the inverse, when you use the GII. And the reason why we use these metrics, yeah, more than one, is to be able to show that it isn't limited to just a single uh, a league table operationalization, that it could also, you know, manifest to another way of 
tabulating the outcomes of men and women. And what we find is consistent with our SIMSA perspective, that is the social reality explanation. In those situations, yeah, <coughs> when women are embedded in a society with a very stark inequality between men and women, their support for male privilege is quite high compared to when there is some sort of parity between the outcomes of men and women. And we find a similar trend, although in, uh, inverse uh, here, when we use the GII, yeah? So that when inequality is starkly you know, high, yeah? Uh, um, the divide between the outcomes of men and women are uh, uh, um, you know, highly different. Uh, you find a strong support for male privilege uh, relative to societies where the outcomes of men and women are more equal. Okay, so this again, you know, goes back to the uh, um, the uh, thesis, you know, that we uh, were talking about when it comes to the social reality construct. That sometimes reality, when we are exposed to incontrovertible realities of you know differences or hierarchies that we simply you know acquiesce to these realities yeah not because that is something that we would want if we think about it you know rigorously or if we had you know a different option on the table um, but because we're simply saying this is what it is Okay, and, and that's the, 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 the third and final explanation of Simza that we have at the moment. Now, beyond this three- Uma, Could I uh, introduce a cat in, among the pigeons here? Okay. Um, I know you've got a lot to cover, but you've certainly already covered a lot. <laughs> I like uh, uh, to contest for her uh, notion of social reality. You're, um, I, I'm assuming as a social psychologist, what is real to us varies as a function of the very social system in which we're embedded. Mm -hmm. Now I say real to us, mm -hmm. that's the social perception, <laughs> my perception of what is real. Now you talk about gender equal versus gender unequal societies. That distinction is drawn by using some objective indices mm -hmm. that have been produced by the, uh, I don't know, was it the World Health Organization or the um, some international agency looking at objective indicators of mm -hmm. political, educational, health participation. Uh, comparing men and women across nations. Mm -hmm. Okay, well now down to objective societal reality, but how is it perceived by the actors within that system? Do you know, for example, if you are in a wealthy system mm -hmm. compared to a less wealthy system? Humans have a huge capacity to adapt and not all of them are as well informed about international differences as you and I and most social scientists. What we may be more aware of as <laughs> actors within a society is the Gini coefficient compared to the GNP coefficient, perceived uh, economic in unreality, uh, mm -hmm. uh, inequality, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'm 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 wanting you to ex to uh, differentiate what you might call objective so societal reality, mm -hmm. social reality for the actors and actresses who are involved in this system. Now this distinction becomes hugely important mm -hmm. when you start moving across national societies because you're using the word contested very often as opposed to disagreed with. Now I can see that in some societies, women may disagree with inequality 
to a stronger mm -hmm. extent than men, but mm -hmm. the question of whether they contest this social inequality is quite another issue. Mm -hmm. I've always been struck that John Jost comes from a very volatile, disputatious American social system where everybody is protesting almost everything, it seems, mm -hmm. and being very vocal and mm -hmm. group supported about it. Mm -hmm. This simply does not happen in hierarchical societies of which Asians are prime examples. So could, could we extend your use in the world value survey by looking at objective societal indicators as preceding or producing a moderation on the social perceptions of the actors and actresses that lead to greater or lesser socializ uh, socialization, uh, societal um, justification of the systems. Do you yeah. see where I'm going with this? I, I mean, I'm just throwing this out to you because I think you have to be very careful when we start talking about reality and you're talking to a social psychologist who believes yeah. that we see things as we are, not as the world is. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. Uh, you hit the, um, uh, uh, how, do I, how, do, how do they say it again? You hit the bell on, on the head or whatever else. Yeah, <laughs> the so, snake on the head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the nail yes, on that the is, head. yeah, so, uh, this is how, how many a 45 minute talk and you know there are often uh, a f finer details that get you know missed in this sort of uh, um, especially myself passionate talks um, so yes there is a distinction that can be made between objective reality and subjective reality and what seems a uh, the social reality explanation that Simza is offering tallies more uh, to objective measurements of reality. The, the league table, for example, is an objective metric yeah, for deciding who people have agreed to the rules before going to may, uh, do the play. Yeah, and therefore the outcomes are unsurprising. We, those who win have legitimately won. So those who are at the top are at the top and those who are losers are losers by the objectivity of the game. So when you ask individuals who have lost in that contest, who are the winners, uh, reality constrains them, the objective reality constrains them to say otherwise, yeah? So in that instance, the motivation is more based on act, social accuracy. Yeah, to reflect the reality as it is, as opposed to how they would want it to be. Yeah. What what you're saying is absolutely true for people who follow soccer. It's absolutely true for people who um, are, are playing on those teams in soccer. Mm -hmm. But I'm suggesting to you that not all people in a social system compete for a start, that they've been uh, socialized towards harmony, they're not sensitive to conflict. They're not conflict attentive, you might say. And as yeah. a consequence, a lot of this theorizing just doesn't hit home unless we force them to answer questionnaires that have been put together by social scientists coming out of weird societies where there's a lot <laughs> of social conflict and confrontation. You see where I'm going with this. I, I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong at all with what you're saying. I'm trying to enlarge it so we capture the reality, the social reality of individual members of different societal systems. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Michael. Uh, the reality that we try to capture, um, I have tried to uh, de define the narrow uh, purview of that explanation in the sense of when we're talking about objective uh, uh, classifications, objective basis for rating individuals at the top or at the bottom, in which case accuracy motives prevail. However, um, and as you quite rightly mentioned, there are other 
uh, uh, social groups, yeah, other situations in which uh, uh, there may not be uh, uh, instances of conflict or competition, yeah, and other processes may also manifest to explain, you know, like system justifying attitudes in those particular instances. If you, uh, uh, um, if you've had a chance to look at our debate piece also, uh, we're not saying that you know, our es explanation captures the entirety of the ways in which uh, member or, or the reasons why members of disadvantaged groups can support realities, but we are offering more parsimonious explanations rooted in the social identity perspective that does not uh, require us relying on a system justification motivation that we don't yet know whether it exists or not, yeah, that we could use the traditional motivation to try to explain uh, some of, if not entirely, uh, uh, manifestations of uh, system. And this social reality explanation tries to do that, but also mindful that it operates under certain situations uh, where, for example, the, uh, classif uh, the uh, means of, uh, of cl classification or hierarchy is objective. In the case of GDI, it is an objective metric like the Gini index also, like you mentioned a while ago, in the football uh, uh, club, uh, um, football league situation, it is also objective because the rules have been agreed upon uh, prior to entering those. So in those instances, and we were simply trying to address uh, John Joe's objection to the football analogy as being relevant at all, you know, to the explanation of system justification amongst members of disadvantaged, chronically disadvantaged groups. And we're just uh, simply trying to also map these football analogy into another contest, in this case, women, yeah, using the, uh, the gender league table, yeah, and to show that under this specific contest, yeah, that we find, you know, the explanations on the, uh, uh, um, based on the social reality explanation to manifest, yeah. But yes, I do agree with you uh, quite uh, uh, um, um, almost completely uh, there, Michael, that there are other finer uh, uh, bits, yeah, that uh, that could lurk around, you know, this issue that we are talking about uh, uh, on the base uh, uh, on which a number of the propositions that we make may not completely explain at the moment, and which is why we have also uh, um, uh, uh, proposed uh, follow up. Uh, uh, some of that we 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 thought about that and felt the need you know, to create even more social identity-based explanations, yeah, uh, uh, that individual, uh, that uh, researchers can, you know, test beyond the three, the, the um, uh, how, how do we call it, the early three explanations of SIMSA that we have put forward. So one is uh, uh, um, an explanation rooted in cognitive dissonance and we have the data that I have presented earlier to try to support that. One, and another one is conformity to group norms. Yeah, so when we justify the system, sometimes it could just merely be that we are uh, conforming to the norms within societies or, 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 or groups in which we are at that time. It could also be, as we've argued um, elsewhere, uh, due to, for those who are quite familiar with the relative deprivation literature, it depends on you know, who we compare our outcomes with. Yeah, if we are in the middle of the hierarchy, say, yeah, the, the middle class, for example, yeah, which is an example that comes very easily to me now because it is, we're dealing with the income and everything. So um, if you are in the middle class, um, you are, when you look at the outcomes of uh, individuals who are poor or poorer than you are, yeah, uh, you are able to embrace the system that makes it possible for you to accumulate 
you know, the, the comfort, you know, that you have relative to individuals who are the lower rung of the food chain. Yeah, of course, when you make an upward comparison, when you compare yourself with Elon Musk or the other billionaires, you'll probably feel very little as a result that you're probably not getting as much from society or from the system as you should. And that, you know, could also uh, 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 deprave or, or uh, diminish your, uh, the tendency to support uh, the status quo. So it can depend on the mechanisms of social comparison who we compare our, our, our outcomes with. Beyond social comparison, there's also temporal you know, comparison when we compare our outcomes in time. So if our outcomes have improved today and likely to improve even more tomorrow compared to what it was yesterday, then we're also likely to embrace the systems that make this possible. Uh, and there is also the comparison with, you know, other compensatory, you know, dimensions. In which case, oh, okay, uh, I'm not getting it as good on this, you know, particular uh, event. But hey, you know, I do quite all right in this other event, and therefore I would embrace the overarching system in which these two subsystems, yeah, one in which I underperform, one in which I overperform, yeah, are possible. So, you know, these are, there are loads and loads of, you know, uh, uh, personal interests or group interested mechanisms that could allow us to make sense of system justifying tendencies of individuals who come from disadvantaged groups without relying on the theoretically problematic system justification motivation. That's, that's uh, in, in, in a nutshell what our argument has been and will always be. Thank you. I am persuaded. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I, you know, what can I say? I look forward to uh, more questions or collaborations with you, your students. Bring it on, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim, so much for the fantastic uh, presentation. And I thought uh, you mentioned the, the harmony mentality. I thought to get the Q&A started, I would try to imbue myself with the spirit of a harmony mentality. And if system justification is the thesis <laughs> and SIMSA is the antithesis, I just want to offer like a few sketches towards a potential synthesis. Right. So I, I, uh, Judge Just actually came to CUHK a few years ago and I, I brought up, I said, you know, the, the whole system justification idea reminds me a lot of the concept of false consciousness. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, actually that was one of the, the inspirations behind, you know, the, the research on SJT. Mm -hmm. so, uh, false consciousness I find really interesting because uh, non-Marxists will criticize it a lot and say, oh, that's so paternalistic. Basically what false consciousness is saying is that, you know, some people have an inaccurate view of reality. Workers should look at their class uh, position, not their, their nation or their skin color or whatever. Uh, so those are, that's false consciousness. If you, if you identify mostly with your national in group rather than your class in group. And non-Marxists will say that's paternalistic because you're saying what's right and what's wrong, which I find hilarious because everyone believes in false consciousness. You know, liberals think that conservatives have false consciousness because their picture of reality <laughs> is not true. And conservatives think that liberals have false consciousness because their picture of reality is not true. So everyone believes in it. So leaving that aside, that brings us to the ideational level. Like what ideas are in people's heads? What, what is the reality of the world as they perceive it. And so I wonder if there might be a way of, of synthesizing these two different perspectives on some similar phenomena. If we, if we focus on that ideational level and think of it in terms of something like, you know, if you are a, a poor Afro-American person in the United States uh, and you're presented with two different uh, perspectives, two different political perspectives, one of which is a kind of system justifying perspective that says, you know, the capitalist system as it exists is basically as good as it, as it possibly can get. Any other alternative has all sorts of risks. It might result in all sorts of terrible things. 
And the other perspective is, no, we need to organize politically. We need to, uh, uh, you know, have a revolution or at least like a, a significant, uh, uh, you know, reformation of the system. But that's going to require a whole hell of a lot of work. And if you know yes. your, your no, U.S. history, fast. you might get shot you know, like 50 <laughs> times by the police for trying to, to work for uh, some improvement. So then when you get these two ideas, which one is going to cause more psychological pain? The one where you have to do all of this work and you might get shot 50 times by the police is going to have a kind of higher uh, psychic cost or, or more psychological pain. And so that's kind of how I interpret what's really going on at the very most basic level of system justification is these, these ideas that justify systems just feel better. Like I look at my own way of my own worldview and I think, good God, like how am I supposed to convince anyone of this? It's so depressing, <laughs> but that's basically the same thing going on. So do, yeah, you think yeah, that any, yeah. do you think there's any way to synthesize the two if we, if we focus on the ideational level? Cause you've been focused I, on the ideational level a lot. Yeah, yeah, Peter, uh, you, you um, again, hit the ball on the head. Yeah, if I could use that expression. Um, in saying that uh, there is quite a lot that uh, uh, um, system justification uh, uh, scholars and social identity scholars agree on. Yeah, after all, the system justification perspective came out from the social identity perspective in the sense that they accept that personal interest drives behavior and system justifying tendency. That group interest can drive system justifying tendency, but for members of advantage groups. So we agree already on a lot of things. A lot of things that they say make sense, like the cognitive dissonance explanation, which you've also quite rightly teased apart with the real life example here. Yeah, sometimes it can be an uphill battle, yeah, to constantly having to de uh, uh, dwell on one's group's disadvantage, yeah, looking at ways to try to solve it, yeah, to enhance your outcomes, yeah, while it is easier to maybe acquiesce with, you know, what's already going on, you know, to try to, you know, go with the flow, essentially. Yeah. So yeah, but it helps. Yeah, yes, Juma is different from going with the flow. Yeah, That's yeah. Going with the flow is a behavioral aspect associated <coughs> with whether you do or do not justify the theory. And what's missing for me in a lot of this theorizing and research is connecting your justification or lack of it of the social system in which you're functioning to what you're gonna do about it. I think what you're gonna do about it is the interesting question that Peter is, uh, is raising and implying it could be missing here in terms of the psychological calculus of behavior as a consequence of ideology. Yeah, so, so uh, Michael, there are two things which uh, Peter also mentioned. So uh, you could either go out, you know, and, you know, try to upend the system, try to change it in whatever form, but it, it can sometimes be an uphill battle. Yes. In, on the other hand, uh, we can, you know, try to, you know, live with the system, which is what the system justification perspective, you know, try to explain. Now, the difficulty uh, between uh, um, the system justification point of view and our view comes when you ask the question of why people would want to justify or support systems that at least on the surface appear to be disadvantages mm -hmm. to their group interests, yeah? Now, system justification theories believe that, there, that, um, that a separate motivation that does not function in the interest of the self or the group is needed to try to explain that phenomenon. What we are saying is that, no, you don't need an additional uh, motivation that functions outside of 
personal and group interests in order to explain that reality, that you could do well with using the traditional motifs to try to explain that reality than to create a completely new motif that we don't know whether it exists or not. So the issue is not whether a number of uh, the stories or propositions or whatever else, you know, rationale that uh, uh, the system justification scholars, you know, have been printing over the years, by the way, they would have convinced, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, folks, yeah, skeptics, yeah, uh, before getting those things, you know, published. So those ideas make sense. We're not saying that they don't, but we're saying that we have identified a particular logical inconsistency that when you look at it, yeah, when you delve into it, it unravels the whole SJT as a package, yeah? And this is what we're trying to offer, an alternative explanation that relies on group interest to try to, you know, to plug, you know, that hole that the inconsistencies in SJT, you know, has created. So uh, the question is not whether, it's not really whether or not uh, uh, SJT and SIMSA can be reconciled. Yes, at some level they can, because for both, there is an understanding that personal and group interest can, under certain circumstances, and for some demographics, drive system justifying attitudes. The point of de de departure comes when SJT assumes that you know, these system justifying attitudes, especially for members of groups that are disadvantaged by existing realities, when they say that you know, those behaviors are irrational. Mm -hmm. They are not. Oh, well, I mean, we go back, back to a Bob Dylan song, don't we? You know, I'm right from your si my side, you're right from yours. We're just one too many mornings and a thousand miles <laughs> behind. I mean, I I think I might have I might have an example that might maybe illustrate the differences and maybe a way to synthesize them. So if if we take the example of my older sister, who's a traditional Catholic, um, and I am not, uh, people like me and John Jost might look at my sister's ideology and say uh, that is the result of system justification because she doesn't support you know abortion rights. Uh, she thinks that you know uh, women who stay at home and raise kids are are equally. Uh, doing something of equal value is going out into the workplace. And uh, the system justification view might be, well, that uh, belief is partially the result of a desire to justify uh, the system because it's painful to recognize uh, you know, the, the injustice. Whereas, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like within SIMSA, you would take the, the ideology in my sister's head a little more seriously and say, in from her perspective, her group interest is actually served by, you know, more traditional conservative gender policies. Definitely. And then I and then I would say the way you can bring system justification back in and synthesize it is by saying one of the reasons why <coughs> she found this ideology more attractive and it made her feel better yeah. was because it did have the, the function of reducing the pain you would feel otherwise in being in a system where women are- yeah, but you know, that's the problem, you see. For SJT, the belief for members of disadvantaged groups, system justification does not serve their personal interests. So it shouldn't make them feel better. In fact, there is an explicit hypothesis in their 2003 paper showing an inverse, as the, uh, proposing an inverse association between endorsements of system justification and personal well-being. So for members of disadvantaged groups, endorsing system justification should actually make them feel worse, not better. While in our view, we have evidence you know, out there showing that system justification can also make you know, members of low status groups feel better. So the, the problem when it comes to the distinction between SIMSA and SJT is the very idea that, you know, uh, um, 
system justifying tendency can be anything other than you know, serving the interest of the self or the interest of the group. That's where the, um, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, is it cross paths or mm -hmm. our paths diverge? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Part company. It seems to me that if I may add, um, there is one implicit assumptions that um, might not <coughs> have not been uh, explicitly articulated. To me, it seems like um, uh, in the you know um, system justification theory, there is an uh, implicit assumptions that individual have free will and then they have autonomy, and so they are you know by and large individual. You know, it could be um, you know not objectively true, but individual believe in that assumptions or theories of individual agency. Whereas, you know, in, in you know, other cultures, for example, Asian culture, oftentimes we see that people don't or have less of that individual agency, but rather a more collective agency. So the belief is that it's not about individual, you know, free will, free choice. Oftentimes people are embedded in social situations, mm -hmm. even with certain, you know, um, idea or will, but oftentimes they are fat or they are um, shaped and molded by the collective. Exactly so the, the yeah. point we are making, exactly. Yeah. So the that... collective agency would matter a lot if someone believes in collective agency and they are in a disadvantaged situation like mm -hmm. a lower, you know, SES group or, you mm -hmm. know, women. So the way to, make them feel better might be is to explain away their lower status by saying that, well, you know, there is this unchangeable system out there. It's not my own personal port. Mm -hmm. It's because the system is like that, to, that port members of my group into mm -hmm. that uh, poor situation. But I myself might have other <coughs> qualities or I myself have qualities that might not be, you know, related to this poor situation. So it free the individuals from that bad situation. Mm -hmm. So if I think it's in the collective agency system, then, then that will work, you know, the dissociation using the group, you know, especially for, for this advantage group using uh, the group you know, bad situation as a justification. In a way, it's justification too, about mm -hmm. um, the person's own suffering and say that, no, it's not my personal reason. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. because of the system. So that's why, in mm -hmm. a way, they would, you know, endorse the system. Yeah, even yeah. for the disadvantaged group. Yeah. I completely but, agree. Yeah, but in an individual agency society, then that's... <clears throat> Totally different, you know, because <laughs> the assumptions that it's individual have the free choice and free will. And so individual bear responsibility. So if you are in this advantage group, it's harder for you to explain it away your mm -hmm. suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 This, yeah. I think we also make a similar point in that our debate mm -hmm. uh, uh, piece. Yeah. That it could all, you know, depend on how easily individuals are able to explain away you know, no. the situation relative to, you know, when, you know, the forces of, re of reality in, mm -hmm. in um, uh, compel them, mm -hmm. you know, to yeah. uh, embrace the reality in which they live. So I completely agree uh, mm -hmm. with your assessment that collective agency uh, uh, can play quite an important uh, role, which is what, you know, SIMSA is all about anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, Chuma, where are you going to take this work? I mean, what's the future, particularly now that you raise the issue of the fact that things may be different in Asian cultural systems than they are in the particularly weird cultural systems in which this theory was originally developed? Can we go more broadly and to give it a kind of universal application mm -hmm. that is sensitive to the societal realities, the societal cultural reality 
in which individual human beings are trying to make sense, some more, some less, of the system in which they are embedded, keeping in mind exactly what uh, uh, Hong Yingyi was saying, that some people are socialized not to make sense of the system in which they're embedded. Why go through all this stuff? This is the substance of intellectual debates among high class PhDs like us. What's the reality on the street for human beings who have to get through the next day? What's going on in the Ukraine right now? What do they think? How are they justifying the system? Are they justifying their system to a much greater extent now than they used to before the war, before Russians invaded? These kinds of things related to my fundamental question of what are you going to do about it? What are you yeah. going to do about it? After ide ideology, <coughs> what's next? Do we yeah, sit I back comfortably and read our books? <laughs> Uh, hopefully not. So, well, okay. And, well, no, but and, I mean, have we been asking number, that question? <laughs> and a number of these questions that you're asking now is probably, and hopefully, should, uh, um, um, I'm hoping that yes, I, yes. I, I, would, <laughs> I, I would motivate uh, my students enough, you know, to carry on uh, uh, the touch, um, essentially, as, as I have. Uh, 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 hinted uh, in one of the, um, especially the one on the slide, there, there are uh, forces of culture that play a role. And yes, it is very, it is quite ambitious, you know, to uh, um, find a universal theory that applies across culture. I think this is something that we should be aiming for, whether it, it can be achieved. Um, I don't quite yet know. Uh, we can do individual pieces of research at the moment and try to piece together, you know, what we, you know, have. But on uh, the idea, on the fundamental ideas, I think, you know, can have universal application, whether yes. the question is uh, um, the ways in which it can manifest may be different across culture. So exactly. it, uh, uh, things as basic as uh, personal interests or group interests, they're so core that, you know, it manifests, you know, regardless of which culture you are embedded in. Yeah. Yes. So in Asian culture, they might prefer, yeah, to uh, have um, uh, group loyalties take precedence in their decision. Yeah, relative to personal, you know, like interest. In the West, it might be the opposite. They might uh, prefer personal interest to take, you know, the front seat and group interest to be uh, um, at the rear. Yeah, so uh, this can, uh, um, uh, uh, we have the skeleton, yeah, that we think can be used, can be applied across the cultures. But again, it is left for researchers in the cultures, in, in whatever culture in which they operate to try to identify the specific realities in their own culture that could tilt the scale, you know, in one way or the other. And, you know, this is war. Uh, 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 reasonable scientists do anywhere in the world, yeah, to try to uh, 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 look at the phenomenon that they are interested in, you know, based on the realities uh, uh, in which they are situated. So that's that's um, that's the more optimistic, you know, uh, picture that I could paint at the moment. But of course, you know, there are. Uh, it has it hasn't been easy, you know, to get you know these arguments across in you know I think less than since 2016. Also, uh, it hasn't been easy at all. We have it, uh, um, persisted, you know, amidst a very strong, sometimes fierce opposition, and you know our goal is to get. Uh, uh, these alternative view entrenched enough 
for the next generation of SIMS scholars to then begin to grapple with a number of, you know, these final questions that Michael quite rightly, you know, highlighted. Welcome, to, welcome to your future. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to our future. And I want to remind you, Chuma, you have a longer future than I do, according to most according to most objective betting systems. So I want to pass this torch on to you and applaud your use of the World Value Survey, for example, as a way to try and get at these eco-cultural variations that distinguish one society called a nation from other societies not just one group within societies, mm -hmm. which has been the focus up to now, mm -hmm. but the broader perspective that goes up a level to look mm -hmm. at the societal system mm -hmm. and then links it to individual perceptions of actors within those societal systems, mm -hmm. leading to the outcome variable, which is available in the World Values Survey, that you have alluded to of satisfaction with life. I mean, that seems to be a very sensible uh, outcome to assess that we're all, we're all looking for to varying degrees mm -hmm, and to which mm -hmm. all society indicates a person's search within the cultural realities and mandates and norms for being a, a real human being. Mm -hmm. The problem yeah. is those norms differ from society yeah. to society. And if we start getting a handle on those norms, we may be able to get a clearer um, picture, a fuller, let's call it a fuller, a fuller. picture. I, I'm not interested in the debates. I'm interested in the thesis, synth, uh, uh, diathesis, and then the synthesis that we get mm -hmm. out of here. Mm -hmm. And you're suggesting it in your work with the World Value Survey. And that data is out there. If you can be clever and creative mm -hmm. in putting together the measure and persuasive, because you're going to have to persuade a skeptical exactly. audience out there. <laughs> <laughs> and throughout your presentation, I've been wondering, <coughs> where is John Jost when we really need him? <laughs> what would he have to say? I mean, he, uh, he's a, a very open-minded guy. Uh, he came and gave a presentation to, to, to this seminar group that, that Peter is carrying on from CY2. And he, he was wonderfully open to the cultural question. It's just not present for him in, in his thinking. He's <clears throat> locked into this American focus in mm -hmm. social psychology. That's understandable. But Hong Ying Yi and I and Peter, those, those of us who are listening to this presentation have been released from that prison of consciousness. <laughs> now, the question is, the question is, what are we going to do about it? Collaborate. And, Let's do more work. And find ways in which no consciousness is false. Mm -hmm. No consciousness can be false. It is what it is. It's an adaptation to the realities that you've survived so far. Mm -hmm. And we're all survivors. You know, we've done much better by most <laughs> metrics than most other people who graduated with us from primary school. <laughs> right now, how did that happen? I mean, that's what we gotta be explaining in life if we take a broader point of view. Mm -hmm. anyway, I, uh, I misinterpreted, <laughs> Michael, your, your previous question. I thought you were basically like channeling Marx and asking, basically saying uh, social psychologists heretofore have attempted to explain the world. The point, however, is to change it. So actually, I, even though that was a misinterpretation of your question, I wonder if, Chuma, you have, you have any ideas like, do you think that, that the SIMSA understanding might help us better understand uh, how people's minds are working in dealing with systemic problems such that we might have some tool or find some tool to change it. Yeah, that's, that's the goal. That's absolutely 
uh, the goal uh, so that we um, uh, uh, have uh, a, a, a set of explanation or, or tool, as you uh, quite rightly uh, uh, called it, uh, that we could use to try to get a handle on a number of, you know, things that, um, you know, using the mindset of a system justification motivation, yeah, traps us into, you know, making a number of uh, 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 logical, you know, um, uh, errors and so forth. So yes, that that is the goal. In fact, we've 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 started looking at uh, the issue of compliance. You know, during the lockdown, as an instance of a system justifying you know orientation, the extent to which in, individuals can forego personal pleasures, group based you know. Uh, 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 interest to adhere, you know, to uh, societal norms or public health norms, you know, that undermine, you know, their ability, you know, to make ends meet. So for when you're talking about, you know, in, uh, individuals who come from low income background, you know, their ability to put food on the table, you know, it is dependent or proportional to them, you know, actually going out, you know, to fend for themselves. Whereas for, for the rich, most often, you know, the need to actually go out uh, in the workplace is not, you know, as uh, severe. Yeah, so you have this inequality there when it comes, you know, to lockdown. But, you know, you still find that, mem you know, those individuals who are disadvantaged more by this lockdown still, you know, uh, uh, um, support, you know, uh, the, the measures that have been put in place. Again, this, you know, brings me to another point that we haven't yet uh, uh, published, which we di discuss in-house, yeah, that a, a number of these things, you know, can also be tied to what economics, ha uh, um, our folks, um, our colleagues in, economics have thought a long time ago in making the scale of preference, yeah? So our interest, personal and group interest can also be calibrated, yeah? So that, you know, what might seem an immediate interest for individual or a group at this particular time may not be the, you know, have the same urgency, yeah, for another, individual or group at that specific time also. And their system just for the ways in which they uh, um, negotiate with the system or try to live with the system depends on the importance, the urgency of the interest that they you know, have had to meet at that time. Whether it be a psychological interest tied to their group, whether it be a symbolic interest tied to the group, whether it be a material interest Tied to the group. So at, at, at present, there seems to be uh, an often uh, um, uneven reliance on material, you know, uh, uh, interest. And when individuals, for example, who come from low income backgrounds do not support uh, uh, redistribution of of wealth, we fail to address the other, you know, um, a related question of whether there are other interests that may be satisfied by their action other than the material interest that may seem obvious to the onlooker. So this is, you know, something, you know, that we think is lacking in the system justification literature because they look at interest from a very uh, narrow, uh, 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 single-minded, uh, if you like, uh, perspective rather than taking a broad view when it comes, you know, to the uh, uh, numerous interests that may be competing for attention at any given time. So these are, you know, some of the, you know, ideas that we are toying with, you know, that we are also trying to uh, uh, show uh, experimentally uh, and, you know, hopefully uh, be able to get <laughs> those out if, if, if they allow us to do so. <laughs> Who are they? 
<laughs> they, that shit, that, that shall not be named. <laughs> Re- reviewer two. Is that for reviewer two? <laughs> yep, reviewer two. <laughs> well, I, I noticed you did have an R and R for journal yeah, of exactly. political so psychology. We, we are managing. <laughs> We are managing, given you know the odds, uh, before we could publish our very first paper, and uh, you, you could also tell you know by you know the um, uh, uh, the outlet in which we published it, that was like uh, almost like uh, a, this gigantic force you know against uh, the ideas that we are. But we are we are uh, uh, delighted and hopeful now. Uh, that with you know the publication of these few uh, ones that we have out there now, that it should stir you know sof- sufficient you know skepticism uh, uh, um, amongst our peers, you know, to want to at least you know probe uh, 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 these issues themselves. Well, I wow. haven't been asked to review your papers, but I'd be delighted. <laughs> I'd be delighted if I were asked. But now I'm beginning to worry because I have a paper currently under review at the Journal of Political Psychology that takes a systems point of view, and we'll have to see. (laughs) Yeah, it should be rest assured. I haven't been. uh, There is a particular crowd for, uh, I believe, and this this could be uh, my complete paranoia uh, for um, uh, political. Psychology mostly off limits for for the kind of work that we do, but we are gradually inching in now with the revise and we submit that we currently have, and we only have had it because we yeah, we are uh, what we were doing was essentially critiquing a paper published in political psychology. So there isn't any way that they can overlook you know, that um, critique that we're making that was published in their pages. So this is the paper from Bouchel et al. They incorrectly interpreted, you know, their data. They uh, assumed, you know, that they found support for the system justification. When we asked them for their data and reanalyzed their data with their script, we didn't find, you know, those, supportive evidence that they claimed. In fact, in most instances, we found the opposite of what they reported in in that paper. So we are hoping with that uh, uh, foot in the door, um, hopefully, uh, if it doesn't get rejected in the actual review, because in the editor's review, five reviewers were invited to look at this paper. Five (laughs) reviewers. Wow. <laughs> and that's just the <laughs> editor's triage, you know, just to look at it to see whether it could be sent to a peer review or not. We had five reviewers make that evaluation. So we have a very lengthy list that we're working through now. Hopefully, we could address all those points and resend. Hopefully, uh, they, they get to publish it because um, it would be. Uh, it, w- it, w- it wouldn't be doing the field service by retaining uh, 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 data uh, that you know and you have been told uh, are inaccurate. Well, that was that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, are there <laughs> any further questions? No. <laughs> All right. Well. Chuma, thank you so much. That was a great presentation and also, I, I would say, an even better uh, discussion. So uh, I really appreciate you coming and, and sharing your time with us here today and uh, uh, hope to see your future research output and perhaps another presentation on the, the next uh, series of work you do. Yeah. yeah. The, and, and by the way, before we go, there is um, a, a paper that we've just got out now on Brexit and Trump. 
uh, in frontiers in uh, psychology. Uh, there was enormous op opposition to that paper since 2016. So the miracle is that we've got it accepted in 2022, <laughs> nearly <laughs> six years, six odd years uh, since that study was. So do have a read and, and uh, ho hopefully, you know, uh, uh, use that in your research one way or the other. Shuma, before you 